Hello and welcome back to the Red and White podcast. Uh, joining me today to review the game yesterday, uh, a 0-0 draw away at Northampton, not the best result, uh, is Sun and YouTuber, a uh, Roper Report podcaster and former member of the Sun and Media team, Connor Bromley. Uh, Connor, thanks a lot for coming on. How are you? I'm good, yes, I'm good. I'm uh, crossing into enemy territories, changing podcasts, normally doing Roper Report on a Sunday morning, but today I'm doing yours. But no, it's, it's, it's good to be here. It's nice to see a different face rather than the ugly lot down at Roper Report. Well, I'll take, I'll take that as a, as a compliment. I'm sure they won't mind. Um, to jump straight into the game, uh, obviously yesterday, 0-0. I wouldn't say we created many chances. I wouldn't really say that they challenged us at all, really. Do you think it was a, a, a fair reflection of the game? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think Sunderland um, really put themselves on the on the match. I don't think Northampton particularly did either. You could tell Sunderland hadn't played football for a couple of weeks. We only had, what, two days training. It came in 27th, 28th, and then they would have travelled. Um, you know, on on the second, so I don't think there would have been that many days prep for Sunderland, and I think that showed. It looked kind of like a early preseason game, you know, when a team's not like um, not clicking properly, looks a bit jaded. All the efforts are there, but just not really got that spark, that creativity. Football is, you know, to find margins, isn't it? You know, you you know from years of watching Sunderland, the amount of times we've lost a game by a goal or won a game by a goal, and you know, yesterday it was fine margins, but nobody had the the margin to get the winner. So I thought a nil nil draw was fair. I think most fans probably watched it and tried to sit through the ninety minutes. I mean, I know I just about managed to to do it awake. It was it was that bad of a match. It was it was really um, it reminded me very much of the Parkinson era of only a month ago. It, it was that bad. Yeah, like like you say, with fine margins. I mean, it it is the fine margins where if we had just took one of those few chances that we did have, it would be a completely different result. And, Although we probably wouldn't be, you know, waxing lyrical about a, a brilliant performance, we would probably end up at least sitting here saying, well, you know, we, we got three points uh, in the end. I, I think you're, you're is a fair point as well when you say that um, about us looking as if it had been quite quite a while since we'd played and that it looked a little bit like a, a pre-season friendly. Um, I think it's a, it's a point that a lot I've seen a lot of people make already. Uh, I was watching the SFC fan TV live stream when I was watching the game and it's a point they kept making where it, it just looked as if we weren't, we were just off the pace a bit and and and, and not not quite at it, which I suppose is um, is fair when you consider that you know we, we haven't trained or, or played in a little while. And Northampton only played the other day. Um, do you think if it hadn't been for COVID, we could have won that game quite easily? I think COVID it, it'll have a massive impact on Southern because you you think about it when when you bring a new manager in and they get that that big win. You know, we went down to Lincoln and won four nil. Lincoln, who are currently top of the league. We went down there, took the mick out of there and won 4 0. Then we obviously had COVID hit for the Wimbledon game. And I think it took all the momentum kind of away. And, and you have that little break. And I think had it been a normal season with COVID not there, it would have been very, very different. Um, and I feel I, I worry almost that we've lost that early momentum and early buzz from Lee Johnson by having the stoppage. And even if you think about, you know, look at Aidan McGeady, he's not played football for a year. He comes in, he looks pretty decent. Then he misses the Wimbledon game because of COVID. So I think he only played two, three games. He played the the Wigan game, the Checker Trick, or the whatever it's called now, whatever the trophy is. Papa John's, yeah, um, the second best takeaway pizza in my opinion. Domino's just about nudges them. Um, he played that game and then he played the the one against Lincoln. Then he missed the Wimbledon game. So he's went, you know, probably over two weeks without without kicking the ball, and well, probably two weeks on the dot. So you go from not playing for a year to playing three games in a week. To not play for two weeks and then play it again. It was no wonder that he was off the pace yesterday because he, his body is probably very confused about what it should be doing because it, it's it's had a, no football, a lot of football, then no football again. It, it, you know, and they're only human. They're professional athletes, yes, but they're only human. And I think, you know, if you asked, you've seen Bolt to run three times in a week, then not run, well, not run for a year, run three times in a week, then not run yeah. for two weeks and then run again. You probably wouldn't get the desired results from him. And, you know, I think there was a lot of that. You know, I, I saw that yesterday in McGeady's performance in particular. He looked off the pace. His touches were wrong. He's he couldn't beat his man. The amount of times he did the the McGeady kind of shuffle inside that you see him do all the time, and the touch was too big, so the defender got past him. It was, you know, it happened countless times. And, and to me, that's that's nothing to do. You know, McGeady's not suddenly forgot how to do that. That's just rustiness. That's just not being sharp. Maybe that's the kind of thing where Lee Johnson needed to maybe bring him off a little bit earlier rather than Jack Diamond. I was surprised that McGeady lasted about 80 minutes yesterday. Yes, yeah. I thought he looked he looked really, really 
like he was struggling. That's it's not me, you know, digging him out. He was struggling for reasons that are fair, but I didn't think he was at the races yesterday. And I think the whole team sort of suffered from that as well. I, I don't think we looked um, anywhere near what we were against Lincoln a couple of weeks ago. I think you're exactly right with McGeady, and I think with him being off the pace for me, he was the, the entire team turned a bit off the pace yesterday. But he was playing in particular that I pick out where, as, as you see, it's that little it's that little shuffle inside that he does. But he kept doing it, and the defender was getting the ball there first. Or he would go on the inside, but the defender would block the cross. He just didn't seem to have that same sharpness about him, which I guess is something that you only um, that you you only acquire when when you've played so many games in a row, and when you're so used to so so, so in, in in a routine of playing. And obviously, that's the, the routine is is the very last thing he's got uh, at the moment. So you know, he's probably a player who's struggled the most out of anyone with him being jumped back in and then taken back out and. Let's just hope it doesn't happen again. And you know, hopefully now he, he can um, work on uh, a little bit momentum. Um, yesterday, I, I had I had a, I was making notes. I said, "Where well, is the game lost?" And, and, and what I mean by that is that you know we dropped two points, and yesterday it did feel like a loss. You know, we weren't coming away thinking point gained. Um, obviously, we, we've mentioned the lack of the lack of sharpness. Personally, I think especially in the midfield, we gave the ball away too, too early. Um, and going forward and have much creativity. You mentioned Diamond there. I think as much as he's been brilliant since he came in, he didn't really offer us much yesterday. Probably just an off day for him. Maybe he wasn't quite match fit. Um, I, for me, I, I would say those are the, the, the two things that cost us really because I thought we were quite solid defensively. Would you agree with us when, when, when I say that? That's where the game was kind of lost um, to use, uh, uh, to, you know, you got to put it somewhere. Um, yeah. If not, was there anything else? No, I think you're right. I think um, Josh Gowan and, and Grant Le- um, sorry, Josh Gowan and Max Power uh, were particularly bad yesterday. You know, and um, Power to me hasn't been, to be honest, he's not been the player was signed. You know, it feels like when he first came in, he was brilliant. Then, then first few months, and he had all them red cards, and I don't think he's ever really found that form again. And this season particularly, he's been, you know, he's really took a step backwards. Josh Gowan's a player I actually like. Uh, I think he's, he's he's decent enough. I'm not saying he's a he's a world beater, but I think he, he is uh, a good player at this level. And I thought he was really, really poor yesterday. I thought he he given the ball away a lot. He gets, you know, chances and, he, and he's so poor in front of goal. There was one where McGeady put a ball across and I think Danny Collins even sort of said, like, why is he not throwing himself at it? He almost shied away. Um, and it would have been a tap in, you know, if he, he got there. So I think I think he had a poor game. But on the flip side, you're right about the defense. The defense looks strong. I've been worried a little bit about Bailey Wright in recent weeks. I think he's he's yeah. been off the boil quite a lot. And yesterday he looked more like an old his old self. I thought Sanderson looked really good yesterday, yeah. and it reassured me that you know, I mean, I really look, like Jordan Willis. I think Jordan Willis is is a really yeah. really good player. But it assured me that you know, if we were to pick up an injury. To say Bailey right now, well, I'm confident that Willis and Sanderson could do a job next to each other. I think as well, another player who a lot of fans didn't like, um, Conor McLaughlin. He is he's not let us down this season, you know. I think he got a, a reputation last year. People got to remember as well, though, he was playing the third man in a three man centre back, which isn't his position. That's what he came in. Jack Ross signed a right back and, and didn't play with a right back. Then Parkinson came in and barely touched him, didn't play him. So we all had this very negative view of Conor McLaughlin, and now we've put him in at right back. Like you know, he's not a world player. He's not going to be bombing down like Kyle Walker. That's not what he is. But he's a steady enough defender. He's not really. I can't recall him making too many mistakes this season. And you know, he's shown that. I think in this league, sometimes you need players like him who are just reliable. You know, they're not going to do anything spectacular. You look at like Denver Hume on the other side. Denver Hume has that little bit more of a spot. I know his final product's not brilliant, but. At this level, he's a player that oppositions worry about because they know that he's pacey, he overlaps, yeah. he, he's essentially an extra attacker, and oppositions worry about that, but they also know that and exploit him because he's defensively not quite right. You know he's going to be out of position quite a lot. So having that balance of having McLaughlin, who's not really going to push forward, but having Denver on the other side, I, mean, I know Denver didn't play yesterday, but having Denver on that other side does make a, a difference. And I think McLaughlin's give us quite a bit of balance Certainly for Lee Johnson, when Denver comes in, I think it'll be a, a a good mix of having them two together. So there were positives. The striking situation is is just it's poor. It, there's no other word to describe it. 
nothing against you know Charlie Wakes had a good season. Um, Agreed. You can't sit here and criticise him. He scored, I think, he scored ten goals this season. But top scorer, I think. Anyway. Yeah, he, he's doing well going forward, but that that kind of be the only option, you know. And Will Grigg, you know, we'll probably talk about him a little bit just because he's, he's potentially out for the season. He's. Okay. I don't think we've ever played played the right football for him. I'm not going to defend him too much because I think he's also been shocking, but I don't think he was ever given a chance to succeed at Sunderland, really. Um, Danny Graham was just a waste of money. I kind of not fathom why that, that, that decision was made to bring him in. I don't get it. And then obviously Kim Bjork has struggled with injuries this season. And I think he would have maybe been knocking on the door. And I think he's a player that Lee Johnson would like. But we all know where the issues are at Sunderland. The, the issue is, is that they don't have... That central midfielder who'll take control of the game. Yes, we've got Grant, who's good. He's good at what he does, but he's he's not going to control. He's not going to be box to box, you know, because of his age, because of his legs, and you don't want him to be that. That, that that's not what he is. And we we don't have a striker, you know, a striker capable of of doing all the jobs, you know. And I don't think that's too much to ask at this level. It's not too much to ask to expect a striker to win some headers and be able to run the channels. Yeah, I know. It's not a giant leap. To, to, to get them things so we know where I mean, it, it doesn't take a genius to realise where the issues are and I think Lee Johnson will probably be working very hard to address them maybe not in January but certainly the summer I think January will be short term options loans probably don't think we've got the budget to do much else in terms yeah. of wage you know just the actual um, EFL League One wage restrictions that are in there I don't know what we can really do yeah um, I think if, if we're looking at January transfer window, I, I'm expecting a, a lot of loanees and, and a lot of young players um, because we, 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 with a salary cap and unless we're going to offload some players who are on high wages, which we might not even want to do, um, we're, we're going to struggle to bring players in. I think you're exactly right when you talk about the striker where I don't think, I don't think you can have any rights to complain about why. I mean, he is our top goal scorer and he has, he's done, a, he's done a, a decent job so far this season. I don't think you're going to expect much more of him as an individual. I think with Will Grigg, obviously, you know, we mentioned that he, there's, there's potentially he can be out for the season. Um, so maybe our luck's turning. Um, he, <laughs> he, uh, you know, I, I think as much as maybe we haven't always played the right football for him, he still has had his chances. And I look back at those kind of first five to ten games and I think he probably could have scored in every single one of them if he just put his chances away. You know, one-on-ones, open goals, maybe a time when he had one play at the beat and put it in or maybe there was a cross if he just committed, he could have gotten the end of it and scored, but, but he didn't do it. Um, so as much as I think you can say we didn't play the right football for Will Grigg, I still think he has had these opportunities and he just hasn't taken them even ones this season. There's been times when the MK Dons at home, you think you you know you you put your house on on a so on 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 me or you score and that you know what I mean where mm-hmm. um, and, and you know he, he hasn't taken it. So as much as maybe we haven't always played perfectly to his style, I think he, he still has opportunities. And I think with Danny Graham, uh, he's a player I've defended quite a lot, and, and, and I've said that I think sometimes. He can offer us something, and what I mean by that is, that I don't think he's a goal scorer, but I do think he's a he's a decent target man, and I think he'll offer you something where he will put 100 percent in. Um, he's a bit of a target man where he's going to win the odd header, and he's going to he's got a little bit of strength about him, but I also think he's te- technical ability is quite decent where he can maybe drop into the midfield deficit slightly and almost kind of do what what Firmino does, where he drops a bit deeper and tries to bring other players into the game and create space for us with the experience that he's got, but. Let's be fair, he's not going to score 20 goals to the end of the season, and I think that's what we really need. I don't think that... I'd say I, I, I think your assessment there, Danny Graham, is, is kind. Uh, I, I, I don't see what he, he offers. There was The one thing I would say about Danny Graham is, is when I have seen him, he has got an areas to score. I think there was a Charlton game earlier this season where I think he could have had a couple of goals, he, and he was getting in the right places, which often our other strikers don't do, but to me, I just see a player who's He's lazy. I, I don't. I think he looks a little bit overweight. I, I don't think he looks. Um, he doesn't look like a professional footballer to me. And the first time he was here, I thought the same thing. And he's came back, and I thought, well, we've dropped a couple of levels. Will he be better? And I don't think he has. I think he's came here for a final payday of his career. I think he he's from up here, so he's probably happy to be living back home. And this will be his last contract, and he'll do. He'll, he'll finish in the summer and not play again. I just cannot understand for the life of us why our recruitment policy in the summer was to bring in a finished 36 year old yeah we know and also it's it's the fact he also has baggage so maybe i'm being so harsh on him because i remember him 
the first time being so bad. I mean, I don't know how old you are. How no, old are yeah, you? I was, I was, I was a season ticket holder at that point, yeah. Yeah, well, I was just going to say, I know, because I know in my memory, like, Kevin Phillips and stuff, I remember them, but I don't remember how they played, if you know what I mean, from when I was like, No, no, I, I, I remember the, the, the frustration that Danny Graham caused. Yeah. So, I think that was the worst thing. Like, now, with me as a fan, I didn't really give him much of a, a chance because I saw him play, like, 100 games the first time he was here and be absolutely useless. And then he scored one and it hit off his arse and went in and he celebrated it like he'd took on four players and bent it in the top corner. I remember all them things and how poor he was that first time. And then he's came back and I've not seen him really do much to sort of change that. I think these performances have been poor and I, I don't think I've seen him really put in 110%. I, I, I just cannot understand why Phil Parkinson would think that that was an answer going forward. You had a slow strike. As, that's the problem. We yeah, didn't have if, any if pace we were to sign anything, it would be someone different. Yeah, we had no pace going forward. Even last year when he had Semenyo, he never played him. And he had no pace. And he came in and brought a 36-year-old who has no pace. It didn't make any sense. And I think at the time, everyone was trying to justify it. Well, you know, he's got goals at this level. But that's not what we needed. We needed somebody who's got a little bit of, well, pace. Just a bit of, you know, running the channels. Able to get in behind. We don't have a striker that's like that. Mm. It's simple. And uh, just the fill. I mean... You know, there wasn't much of a game to talk about yesterday, so I don't know if you just want to turn us <laughs> turn us into a Phil Parkinson bashing session. Um, I'd certainly be able to talk for a couple of hours if it was that. Uh, no, I, I I do agree with you about us bringing him in at the time. Um, you know, at the time when we brought him in, as 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 much as I wasn't too negative about, a part of us did think, wait, he's not exactly what we need. You know, we we, we could do with someone who is a bit a bit pacing, a bit different. I think I, I mentioned Semenyo on, on the last one of these as, as, as a potential player to come in along with um, Carl Sterling, who I didn't realise, but he's now at South End. But I just I, to me, but when I look when I look at us going forward, you, if you want if you want Danny Graham playing the team, you, you've got a player who's just slightly better than that in Charlie Wyken. He's a sim- similar type of player where. Um, Really, if you were thinking, right, let's get a third strike, it would make a lot more sense to go go for someone like a, a, a Semenyo or or a, a Carl Sterling or just someone with a little bit of pace about them who's going to offer us something different. Because, you know, what, why have two of the exact same player when you can just go with something different? And when when things aren't going your way and things don't work out, then you can switch switch tactics. But I think with Phil Parkinson, I, I think one of the things that he was quite keen on was just playing with the target man. Um, and I don't think he wanted to play with little, quick, nifty strikers. And I think that's why, probably, to be honest, why um, he, he would have preferred to go with Graham other than someone like Semenyo or any... I'm sure there's any number of players similar to Semenyo in Premier League academies and what have you. But I, I don't think Phil Parkinson would have really utilised uh, an, 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 attack, an attacker like that because I just I don't think they're his style. And I think he, he was far too dogmatic and one-dimensional to even look at it, having another option as much as if you had another option, all of a sudden you can just change, change tactics slightly, go up play the ball on, on the floor more and, and, and utilise some, some some different attributes. I think yesterday they had that big centre about his name, Bulger, I think his name was. Six foot six, big guy. And he was going against Charlie White. It's no surprise Charlie White was struggling in that battle. You look at what we have to bring on to replace Charlie White up front. You swap him for Danny Graham, and you're you're right in what you're saying. There's there's no difference that that centre back isn't thinking I'm going to have to change my game here. Whereas if you had a a niftier player, maybe even a worse player, but a one who could, you know, get the ball into his feet and turn quickly, or or even just try and run the channels and get him behind, it would have been a very different proposition for Lincoln. Uh, sorry, for for Lincoln, uh, for Northampton to to deal with in. That's the the issue we have. The the strikers are are too similar, especially now we've only got two strikers because uh, Will Grigg looks like he's going to be out for a little bit of time. We, what's the change? If you're a centre back, you're like, oh well, they've swapped Charlie White for Danny Graham. I don't have to change the way I'm playing. I can play exactly the yeah, same. Yeah, way. Exactly. What, what you actually want is is like a a thorough you know change in thought process. We've got that with our wingers. To be fair, I think our wingers. You know, you, you look at McGeady, He's trickery. Maguire is again, he's a tricky player. Gooch is a bit more direct, and Jack Diamond is definitely just 100% direct. We have a little bit of change for what our wingers are, which which will make it. So, yesterday when he made them substitutions, I thought, oh, well, this could actually change the game because then fullbacks are going to be used to having McGeady, who's a bit more tricky, who tries to, you know, do the McGeady shuffle inside all the time. Jack Diamond, who's a bit more direct and pacey. Switching them around, you're like, right, okay, I can see a little bit of difference here because Maguire's kind of a 
he's similar to McGeady, but he is a little bit different. I think Maguire is the type of player where it's not necessarily... I, I don't think he's the type of player like McGeady where he can beat a player particularly well. He's not, he's not got the pace to get around a player, but I think with Maguire, he pops up in the right positions at the right time. Mm-hmm. He can have an awful 89 minutes, but he'll have that one moment in the game when... Well, it's like it's like Port, Portsmouth going all the way back to the first season. Portsmouth in the playoff semi final when yeah. he didn't have a great game, but then that one moment when the Mark Clark had the ball out of the edge of the box and he was at the volley in. I think that's what Maguire offers you. Where it's that it it it's not. It, he's a very. I think he's a very different player than McGeady. I would disagree with you there because I I think that um, McGeady's game is is taking on players and finding that yard of space and hitting it or putting it across him. But I think Maguire's is just being in the right place at the right time often. I think. I think what I meant by similar, though, is that wh- whereas Gooch and Diamond are kind of like pure wingers, McGeady and Maguire aren't. Like, yesterday, if mm. you watch McGeady, he finds a lot of his time. He, he's more inside. I think he was a number 10. Uh, what's what I mean? We're kind of similar. They're similar in yeah, that yeah. position. They're different players because I think Maguire is almost like a striker who plays on the wing. Mm, he's, yeah, as agreed. you say, right positions. He's a bit of a pull chair at times. Um. You know, he will score if he played every game in the season. He probably would get ten to fifteen goals. It's, he is a bit more like that. Whereas McGeady is, he's a bit more about trickery. He's a bit more about beating his man. He's a, he's a bit more about you know he does put in a lot of balls into the area. I think McGeady's option in his head is always can I cross it or can I shoot. Whereas Maguire, you often see the most frustrating thing with Maguire is the fact that he just constantly cuts inside. You know, he's like he's on the wing, and you're like, oh, he's going to cross it. No, he's not. He's going to cut inside. Oh, he's going to cross it. No, he's not. He's going to cut inside again. Like he does that quite a lot. Which, you know, but you know that's why he's a League One player in it. At the end of the day, if he was, if he was the Maguire with C for five games a season, he wouldn't be playing for Sunderland. At this no, time. absolutely. I think if he could, you know, play at his peak all the time, I think he'd probably be a, probably a, a very very decent Championship player. And you know a team that's that's pushing for promotion really, but it's it's his inconsistency that that puts him in League One. I think really. I think technical ability wise, yeah, he probably is a, a top end championship player. But he's he's let down by the fact that I don't think, um, and I think he would probably admit this himself. I don't think he's been necessarily a hundred percent dedicated to being a footballer like what somebody who's at that level is. You know, I think Maguire's never. Mm, um, yeah. I, I think he was maybe just a, somebody who wasn't... I'm not saying he wasn't 100% committed. He obviously is. To get this level, you have to be 100% committed. Oh, but oh, I just yeah. don't know if he's if he's been distracted, you know, in the past and, and he's maybe went off the boil because his, stories, form yeah. is, his form is very erratic as well. You know, you, you look at somebody who for five games could be your difference maker every week or you could look at somebody who... And he's in one of these spells at the minute where... He just every time you see him play, you're like, oh, I don't really see what he's particularly offering us going forward. So I think that's him. You know, that he's 29 now, 29, 30 year old. He's not going to change. You know, we can't expect to see him put in a consistent 46 games, but that's why he's playing for us at this level. You know, if he was consistent, he wouldn't be here. He'd be playing, you know, he's been in the championship before and he didn't cut it. And that's probably why. Yeah. But equally, you know, in a month's time, we could be sat here off the back of like three. Three incredible performances where, where he's won us the game. He's, he's just that type of player. Um, obviously, we mentioned, we briefly touched on uh, how uh, defensively sound we were yesterday. Um, I thought Deion Sanderson did have a good game. As much as uh, I mentioned yeah, yesterday on the Fans Jack channel, I thought he, he gave the ball away quite cheaply going forward. But I suppose that that you know that, that that's part and parcel of, of, of playing someone who's you know not a natural left back at left back. But I thought defensively was quite sound. I thought everyone was good defensively, but. You know, I, I don't think they really challenged us, but you know, as, as much as as much as you can say that, you know, we did stop whatever challenge that they did put up. I can't really think of a time when I thought, oh no, they're going to score here. Um, obviously, it is now January. We're in the January transfer window. There was a, a rumor going around yesterday about uh, Carl Winchester. I assume you've you've heard about that, and it seems as if from Forest Green Rovers, then um, that um, is quite a, close to being a done deal. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I don't tend to buy into rumours until anything's uh, confirmed, really. Um, but if you know, if you could go out and um, if you could go out in the giant transfer window and sign anyone um, within reason, obviously with the salary cap, um, who would it be? Oh, within reason. Uh, I wish I had a bit of time to prepare. Um, no, it, it, it is a hard question. Someone asked the same question to me, and I just thought, I have no idea. But it's difficult because to me, like. Because they've changed, they've now got like the technical directors, and it's all going to be about recruitment. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's fitting into styles. 
it's not going to be when I had the old system where Tony Corton was there. It was very much like he'd go, you know, oh, he's a good player. We'll sign him. There wasn't much thought about, well, where are they going to fit? This is kind of what we're talking about with Conor McLaughlin. Like, Conor McLaughlin is a decent right back, but he was never able to play in a three at the back. So they brought him in, even though they weren't going to play with a right back. Yeah, it didn't yeah, make any sense. It was a now, stupid yeah. sign. And it made no sense. If you think about it like that, you wonder like how these people are employed because it doesn't make any sense. Why would you sign a right back when you're playing without yeah. a right back? No when, when the plan is to actually play without a right back, yeah, why sign someone who's really notoriously sense. playing on the, on the right hand side of a back four? Yeah, and you look at like the the midfield options we've brought in. You know, consistently the midfielders we've brought in are always similar. You've got Dobson who's box to box. You've got Power who's box to box. You've got Scowan who's box to box. You've got Ledbetter who sits. So you, in terms of your centre midfielders, there's very little variation. And obviously we've got Dan Neal and Elliot Embert who I think should be forcing their way in a bit more. Yes, yeah. Same. But, that they are different players, but obviously they've not really been given much of a sniff. So what, to me, it's not about the names. I, I, I don't think we could sit here right now and, and say like, you know, you talk about Antoine Semenyo before. I really like Semenyo as a player. I think he's decent. And if they signed him, I'd be happy, but I think he's playing for Bristol City. I don't think well. Yeah, well, like yeah he's, he's made in. a few appearances this yeah, season. He's, yeah, he's been more involved this year. But to me, it's about the type of player they're bringing in. I want to be able to see that they're bringing in a striker. And then when I look at, you know, some even clips of him on YouTube and I see, oh, well, actually he's capable of turning the man. He's capable of running a channel. He's capable of getting in behind. I'd be like, right. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think sometimes, you know, as fans and even as a club, we, we often get drawn into names. I think that comes from being a Premier League club for 10 years. We, we like yeah, yeah, yeah. to see it. That's why we enjoyed when we signed Will Grigg because we were like, oh, well, that's a player we've all heard of. We all know the song. And nobody actually looked at how he actually played and whether or not Formally he played. for a song. Exactly. I don't think it was four million quid, but yeah, four million quid for a song. I think, I think it'll, it'll get there if we get to the Premier League. I don't know. Well, three or four million it was still a ridiculous thing. Yeah, I, yeah it was. But we, when we brought him in, there was no thought. What we should have done was, was went, well, who plays similar to Josh Madger? And yeah, didn't do that. They went, who scored a lot of goals at this level? And sometimes that works, you know. Sometimes it does work to say, well, who scored goals? Can we replicate that? But they brought in Will Grigg and said, well, he scored goals, so that's fine. We'll just shove him in there. Rather than going, how can we get a striker who's going to be successful? It was the same when they brought in. So if you look back at that first season, you can you can point holes at a lot of the recruitment that happened that year under Jack Ross because he brought in Charlie Wyke, but the way we played suited Josh Madger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Josh Madger and Charlie Wyke are two very different players. Yeah, so yeah. how could our system suit Josh Madger so much, even though Charlie Wyke was brought in to be the main striker? To me, that suggests that the, the recruitment policy that season was not thought about. It was just, yeah. well, they've scored goals at this level. Max Power's been good at this level. That player's been good at this level. Rather than actually thinking about, well, actually, how does this all fit together? How we're going to play? I would hope now that we've got the sport and direct there and they're talking the talk and, you know, Lee Johnson's got his, his, his nice little catchphrases. The important thing Pomo. is to think, to actually think, yeah, Pomo, stuff like that. Actually think about Bomb Alley and all them. I like them. Yeah. Um, but to think about how it all fits together. And I don't think since we felt at this level, there's actually been a thought process of, uh, you know, this player, this player will suit the way we play. It's, it's normally this player's done well at this level before, so we'll sign him. That's a fundamental issue. That's actually hit Sunderland for years and years. All the players that we've signed, probably for the last 10 years, there hasn't been a thought of how, apart from that window under Allardyce in the January where he brought in Kasri Kone yeah. and um, I can't remember who, uh, Kirchhoff, and that you could see where they fit in. Normally, it's a scattergun approach. Normally, it's a case of they do well at this level, we will sign them. They've got a good name, we will sign them. It can't be like that anymore. You know, I want Sunderland to sign players where I go, who are they? What? I've never heard of them before, but then you see them playing. Oh, well, they fit into that system. They can do the things that we need in central midfield. It's about the individual qualities of the players. It's not about just bringing in a player who's been promoted from this level before because that's it's almost irrelevant because that player got promoted from this level because they played in a certain system that suited them. It's You, you kind of just replicate it. That's why in football all the time transfers happen and players don't do well. And you go, well, he was class for them. And it's like, well, the reality is it, it's system. about the... Yeah, I mean, I remember just the one that came to my head there, like Sesson Young at Sunderland. The system suited him perfectly, and he was brilliant. Then he went to West Brom, and they didn't play with that system. They had yeah, Tony Pulis. 100%. He was put on the wing, 
and he was rubbish for West Brom. That's kind of it. That that sums it up. We had him playing in that system, and he was brilliant. You sign him for another team, and you can't replicate it without putting them into a situation where they're going to do well. And that's just been a fundamental problem with Sunderland for years, and a fundamental problem since we fell in this league because the the recruitment has been uh, it hasn't been thought about properly. It's been done on paper. It's been done on Football Manager. It's yeah. not been done with actual brains and thoughts. And it's well, it's frustrating when you look back now and see the money that they've wasted and the players that they've brought in and you know how poor they've been. A lot of it's not even on the players. A lot of it's just on the situation they've been put in. Yeah, I think you made that point immaculately. To be honest, um, when you're talking about about player recruitment, where it's not it's not about names, it's about styles. And and I think with with how how much emphasis Lee Johnson seems to put on having a specific style and a specific philosophy and a specific identity and with how Speakman seems to back that, I think we can expect to bring players in who are we might not have heard of before, but who can just fit what it is that Lee Johnson wants to do. You know, he, he has the you know these phrases like Bob Alley and, and Pomo. Um and I, and I think he, he has a real idea with, with where he wants to, to take the squad. And I don't think he's gonna simply go, we need a centre midfielder first instinct who's done well at leg one before it'll be we need a centre midfielder who maybe is, is, is a bit different someone who's got a bit of creativity a little bit drive going forward someone who doesn't just sit someone who isn't maybe box to box like you mentioned someone who is maybe going to be a bit more involved in the final three right well who within our budget is is, is available and get the best fit or we need a striker who can run the channel who's got a little bit pace maybe technically a little bit more gifted than your likes of of, of, of white right Instead of just going who, who which strikers are available in League One, it's who across the broad, the broad spectrum of football is available and bring them in. I, I think you made that that point um, immaculately. And it, it's a difficult question question to answer when someone asks you a, a specific name, um, because some, because sometimes the name isn't always you know we're not always going to know the name, but it's it's the job of, of the recruitment to find one. And if you have to go out to you know. Um, I don't know the the German second division to find that player. Well, then that, that that's what you've got to do. And sometimes those signings that are, are made and you've never heard of the player, but they are the perfect fit. Um, is is exactly what you need. I mean, look at the the example of uh, Kante at Leicester, who you know they, they they signed him from a team in the French second division, but because he was the, the right fit for the team, um, mm. it was you know. It, it, the, the perfect signing really as opposed to just saying, well, what Premier League centre midfielders are, are available. I think you made that point immaculately. Um, to almost to wrap things up, if, if you can, uh, difficult question, but a man of the match yesterday, was there anyone at all? Um, Probably, if I had to pick, I'd probably give it to, to Bailey Wright. I thought he was, re- to be honest, I can't think of anything the defence did wrong. Well, so, Basically, them as a unit did well. Um, I thought Lee Burge did okay on the things he had to do. and He's been a player that's, I think, got a little bit of stick this season, Lee Burge. I think I've given him quite a bit of stick because he, he seems to be making a lot of errors. But I think he, he looked a bit more confident yesterday. Um, but we were told when we got him from Coventry that he was a player that was inconsistent and would make mistakes. Um, again, if he was consistent, he wouldn't be playing in League One, which often I think we as Sunderland fans struggle with because we're used to Premier League football, whereby when Sunderland were playing well in the Premier League, it was because basically nine or ten of the players were playing well, whereas at this level, you actually only need one or two players. Like yesterday, if one of our players, one of our forward players played well, we would win the game. If McGeady yeah. had a good game, he would have scored. If Diamond had a good game, he might have got an assist or scored. Yesterday, we just didn't have anyone who played more than, certainly in the, the front players, who played more than a five or six. Defensively, though, they were rock solid. I, I can't recall Lincoln ever having much of a chance at goal. There was that one penalty they called for where the guy got booked for diving. Yeah. That's the only thing I can recall them doing. So uh, the defence as a whole, but as an individual defender, I would give it to, to Bailey Wright. I guess that's a, that's a fair point. I couldn't really think of anyone, but I would probably say any of the back four because they didn't really do anything wrong. Um, I think that wraps it up, Connor. Uh, thanks a lot for coming on. No, oh, it's been good. It's been oh. good because I'm not recording a Roker report today. It's normally on a Sunday I'm doing Roker report. Um, but obviously the, the change in the way they do it so I was free and I was like well it's nice to talk about Sunderland after a game so I was happy to come on and I like it because it's almost like a therapy session that's what I always call it, it it's a now I can forget about Sunderland for the rest of the day because I've talked about it whereas normally if you don't do a podcast or you don't talk about it you know I'd probably ring my dad later and have a 10 minute bitch and moan to him I might speak to my brother and have a 10 minute bitch and moan to him 
by a bitch and moan to the missus who doesn't care. And whereas now it's just out of the system. I can just move on with my day, watch the football that's on the telly later and forget about Sunderland. So it's important for me to have these Sunday sessions. Yes, indeed. Um, I'll leave all your links in the description below to anyone who wants to go chat. Like, you've got your own channel, haven't you? Yeah, I got my own YouTube channel. I've kind of um, I've uh, over Christmas, I haven't really done much with it. I did a video yesterday, but uh, I just kind of, to be honest, I, I couldn't be bothered talking about something there was nothing happening. So yeah. I was like, well, screw it. Let's just go on the back burner. We'll leave it for a couple of weeks uh, while there was no football. But yeah, I've got a YouTube channel, which is it's doing all right. I'm not taking it too seriously. It's not um. I'm trying to be an influencer or anything. I just kind of, again, it's it's more about the therapy session, especially yeah, yeah. since I'm not watching football with anyone. I need to, to vent something after the game. Normally, you go with your mates and you can, you know, talk. Or even when I work there, I used to, you know, talk to the people I work with and, and say, oh, so and so has been shit, etc. But now it's 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 a case of just the YouTube because I've got no one else to talk to about it. Yeah, I think for me, I, I just think ah. Uh... I'll talk to football, but anyone that will listen, so, so, so why not start something like this? Uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, I think exactly. now uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks to everyone uh, for listening.